hello everyone. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Neil Vite, and I'm a scientific software developer at the European Spallation Source in Denmark and Sweden. I do Python for scientific data analysis and visualization. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, our project. We pronounce it SKIP. Uh, you can come and ask me why uh, after the talk. Um, and it's going to be about multidimensional arrays with labeled dimensions and physical units. And just uh, a shout out to my awesome team, uh, Simon, Jan Lucas, and Son Jung. Um, I'm aware that uh, some people in the audience can't really see the, like the bottom part of the screen, or so I'm going to try and keep what I do towards the top, but just let me know if you can't see. Okay. Um, and I can also make it bigger. Uh, so I'm basically going to do this as like a, a demo in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, I just have a bunch of uh, imports, and I'm defining myself a few useful plotting functions, but that, that's, that's for later. Okay. So, <clears throat> label dimensions, uh, why do we need them? Um, so, say I have a rectangular array, a NumPy array, which has a shape uh, 10 by 20, and it might look something like this. And I would like to slice out the row number four. Uh, I look at the shape of my array, and I know uh, that this is the one that has only 10 elements, so I have to slice out the first index, which is fine. It gives me what I want. However, you can't always deduce from the shape. Um, say now I have something that's square. It looks like this. Now, do I remember which one it was? Was it the first index or was it the second index? Um, and obviously, you know, you're going to get very different answers if you get it wrong. It gets even worse when you have more dimensions, right? Now say I have four dimensions, x, y, z, time, in that order, maybe. I want to get the first z slice. Which one is it? Do you remember? Is it colon, colon, zero, or is it zero? So hands up, who has never struggled with this while using NumPy? Good. That's what I thought. <laughs> If you put your hand up, I would say you were lying. But, uh. So, label dimensions. Um, so this, this really uh, cool project called XRA, if you haven't heard of them, uh, go and check it out. They introduced uh, label dimensions to multidimensional NumPy arrays. And from their documentation, they say, real world data sets are usually more than just raw numbers. They have labels which encode information about how the array values map to locations in space and time, et cetera. And what we have done at the SKIP project is we have embraced and to a large extent copied the X-Array mechanism. And how this works is that you create a, so SC is for SKIP. We create a SKIP array by giving it our, the NumPy array we had above, but now we give it a list of dimension which is going to some strings that are going to label each dimension that we have. And uh, we sort of have some fancy HTML representations for Jupyter Notebooks, but you can see that um, every label for the dimensions and the size are here, and then we have the values. And now, when I want to get the Z slice, all I need to do is give it the Z label and then the index. So compared to colon, 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 and zero, um, this is really nice, easy, but I think most importantly, and that's a point that is often forgotten, it makes your code extremely readable. If I go back to my code a month, two months later, and I look at this, I can see, oh yeah, I was trying to slice the Z dimension. Or if somebody else looks at your code, and I think that's really important. Okay, and then, um, this is also uh, what X-Ray and Skip both have. You can add coordinates. So you can have coordinates on each of the dimensions of your array. And they basically describe the extent of each axis, or maybe how far every data point is from its neighbors. Um, and we have some, some visual representations for this. So say I have um, a two-dimensional array. Maybe it's representing, say, the air temperature 
above a city, so at different altitudes, and as a function of year. So that's your, sort of your dense two-dimensional array. And then uh, in skip and x-array, coordinates are added in a structure called a data array. So you feed it your, your data variable, and then you give it a dictionary of coordinates that are saying the years are from 2015 to 2023, and the altitude is from zero to 8,000 meters. So effectively, what you're doing is, is this. You're adding coordinates to your data. And you can also look at the HTML representation. Uh, so you have your original data that we had, and then you have a, a list of uh, coordinates, altitude, and year. Good. Um, so now I want to talk about what we've added on top of this uh, in, in the, the SKIP project. And the first one is uh, physical units. So every data variable and coordinate in SKIP has physical units. And it was very important for us to have this embedded from the start. Um, there are other Python projects that do this. Uh, this Pint, AstroPy units, this is just for the units. There's a Pint X-Ray project to try and incorporate this in X-Ray, but we needed to have this baked in from the beginning. And uh, I'll just sort of give you an example. Uh, maybe I'll also plot this, and I hope. Uh, ah, never mind. Um, so when you look at the representation, you can see that my X and my Y coordinate both have units of centimeters. So it's, think of it as maybe like a detector panel and I'm sort of imaging some, some counts coming in. Uh, my data has units of counts and um, we can just uh, plot this and it sort of automatically labels the axes. Um, and then now, say, I also have an integration time. I know for how long I've counted when I was recording, say 300 seconds. So I divide my image by the integration time and now uh, the unit is counts per second automatically. It just, the library does this for you. It can do pretty much any combination of units. And you also see the values um, have changed. Uh, so my image has been normalized. So this is really useful if you're dealing with physics and you're, you can't remember if your energy was uh, per unit volume or something like that. Uh, you actually can see by just looking at the unit of your variables. Uh, however, there's an added bonus is that the units also provide protection. Uh, say now I have a background image, like a dark frame, which I want to subtract from the signal image above, but I forgot to first normalize it by integration time. So I have my background, which has units of counts. My image above had units of counts per second, and now the library is telling me, ah, you can't do this. Um, so I first have to divide by my background, uh, uh, my background integration time, and then I can do the, the subtraction here. So it, units are extremely useful in preventing, uh, in early prevention of difficult spots to bug in if you have a very long Python script. Normally you arrive at the end and you don't really understand why the units don't match or something went wrong. This will catch it really early. So they, they save hours, and I mean hours, of debugging time. And they also, I think it's also very important, they, they free up a lot of mental capacity for the user. They don't really have to think, remember, if, did I divide by area or volume or something like that just letting you focus on the important thing, which is doing the science that you want to do. Uh, just as a side note, we can also use units for um, what you call label-based indexing, if you know X-Array. So say I want the slice at uh, 0 0.5 centimeters, and I don't know the index, the number of the index, but I can just say slice X at 0 0.5 centimeters, and it'll just find the correct slice. Um, so it's also nice. This is something uh, that you can do with X-Array, but uh, this is like a really nice way to do it with the units. Okay, the second thing I want to, that we have in addition is what we call binage coordinates. Um, it's sometimes necessary to have coordinates that represent a range for each data value. Say the temperature was 310 Kelvin between 10 and 20 seconds. It's not 
given point in time, you have a range of when that data uh, value was valid. And it's also, this is what you have every time you histogram data. So just like in my image above, when we did some histogramming of counts, it was the counts, um, the counts are this much between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 centimeters or something like that. And um, Skip supports this by having bin edge coordinates, which is a coordinate which has a length of one more than the dimension of your data. So my little representation here, I sort of have an eight by eight uh, image, um, and my coordinates has length of nine on each side. Um, and you can see in the representation that these are usually marked by bin edge, so that they sort of you can see in the representation um, that you have bin edge coordinates. And yeah, this is like the image I had above, but I've binned it, in, or I've histogrammed it into uh, eight by eight bins. You've probably used histogramming with NumPy or Matplotlib, and they will return you the edges and the data separately, <laughs> like in a tuple. Um, we have everything inside a single data structure. Now, this edition has actually allowed us to create something which is, I think, one of the most powerful features of Skip. Um, and this is the third part of my talk. Um, and we call this bin data. So, if I can, no, never mind. Um, so Skip distinguishes between histogram data and bin data. Histogram data is the regular dense arrays when you've basically collected all your counts and then you've done the sum. So you have a value of three between zero and one, um, seven between one and two, and so on. Bin data refers to the precursor of histogram data. It's basically that you have a list of bins and each one of them contains a list of records. And you can, of course, convert from one to the other by summing all the data inside each bins. But you, there is a loss of information here. And you can actually do some cool things if you sort of keep this structure. Um, um, so if, you've, if you know a little uh, something about awkward array, it's basically conceptually similar to a multi-dimensional awkward array. And um, to best illustrate this, uh, I'll do a little example of data analysis. And for that, I'm going to use something called the New York Yellow Taxi dataset. Uh, if you haven't heard of this, it's quite a famous data set in data analysis. Um, it basically is a really long table of uh, data on New York taxi trips. Um, you have a pickup date time, drop off date time, how many passengers, uh, the distance, uh, pick up latitude, longitude, so th this is, uh, for example, uh, an image made of the, num the histogram of pick up latitude and longitude, and you see sort of Manhattan, and here you have the, um, the JFK airport. So um, I got my data set from the, uh, the VEX uh, documentation, which is, uh, if you want, uh, quite a nice project, uh, also for uh, data analysis, uh, go and check it out as well. Uh, so I'm only going to load a subset of this. If not, my laptop is going to cry or scream at me. Um, but basically, I have uh, loaded uh, the latitude and longitude of uh, drop-offs, so where people were dropped off by the taxi, the trip distance, the hour of the day, and how much they paid for the trip. And I have uh, 71 million rows in my table. It's about 3.2 gigabytes in my memory. So if we have a quick look at this data, I'm plotting like one in a thousand points because uh, 71 million scatter points in Matplotlib is all still quite difficult. But you can see, you can see Manhattan and if you sort of zoom in here, you see that you start seeing individual streets. So there's a lot of data in here. Right. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you what you can do if you bin the data into records. Um, 
So working with bin data is actually most efficient when you keep the number of bins relatively low. We can have a lot of bins, but you can, uh, it's basically most efficient when you keep the number of bins low. And binning is essentially like overlaying a grid of bin edges onto our data. So this is kind of what we're doing. We're keeping the underlying data, but we're overlaying a grid wrapper onto it. Um, <coughs> And you can do this with any kind of data which is scattered or like, for example, there was a talk yesterday by, for, about some cosmological simulations that are using particles and you could, you could apply this to, to that, like grouping your particles. Um, and then, so the way I do, I wanna do this is very simple in Skip. I've got my original data array. I do da.bin and I say I want eight bins in latitude and eight bins in longitude. And we'll see, it takes about a second, and now I have my binned uh, data structure, so I have eight bins in latitude and longitude. And then my data is actually has kind of a weird type, it's a data <coughs> array view, and what it's telling me, it's like a view onto my original array. And then it has sort of uh, different bins, so the first bin has uh, 65,000 records in it, second one has 50,000 records, and so on. And so if I naively just histogram this, um, you're gonna get a very pixelated image eight by eight of Manhattan, which is not very useful. Um, but um, because it only groups the data into bins, actually just reorders the data. It, you don't lose any information. It's simply re reordered. So then the bins can use, be used for very efficient slicing or filtering. Uh, so for example, I want to select a bin in Manhattan. So I take the first one in longitude and the fourth in, so the first one and then the fourth, I'm gonna be sort of up here, um, which is probably this one. So you, you just change the slicing to the slicing we did before uh, with the Z dimension, like this longitude, the first one, latitude, fourth. And now I have something like this, um, where I have 770 uh, megabytes out of 3.2 gigabytes, and I have about 17 million records in that bin. And now I have this, because I haven't lost any information, I can re-histogram it at a much higher resolution, and now you can sort of see that you have all the data in there. So it's really, really useful for working on sort of subsets of your, of your data. Um, I'm gonna select another bin, which contains the JFK airport. And you see like, there's kind of hot spots here. Um, and if you look at the map of it, you can see this, the different terminals at the airport. Um, I'm not sure why people are being dropped off on the highway, but uh, you know. Sorry. When you show the Manhattan, there were some people dropped in the sea. Yeah, I'm guessing that's probably inaccuracies in GPS positions. Like it's just recorded by the taxis and. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Now. I've sort of selected a single bin, but once I've done this, what you can do after that is you can then bin this into a new dimension. So let's go back to my Manhattan bin. I have a single bin which um, has 17 million records, but if I look inside it, I can see that I still have all the information on fair amount and trip distance, latitude, longitude, and all this. And so if I want to look at the uh, trip distances inside uh, the Manhattan and JFK bins I've selected above, I take this, uh, this bin that I've sliced out and I make 100 uh, trip distance bins. And now I have uh, 100, uh, a dimension of length 100 in trip distance. And I can plot this, and I can see that most of the trips in Manhattan uh, are usually short distance trips, like less than five or 10 miles. 
And if you do the same with uh, the JFK, you can see that people who go to the airport usually they do a longer trip. So I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. You can do this with pandas, you can do this with X-ray, but the ways I've found to do it with pandas is actually usually not as simple. The syntax I think we have is actually really nice and it also tends to consume more memory, um, especially if you then bin a second time into something. Um, so we have a re reordering the data and makes it really efficient. Um, and then, you can also do other things with bins, like it's a little bit like uh, if you use something like group by. You don't always have to just sum some of the things you have in your bins. You can also do other reductions like min and max or mean. Um, so I have a little questions. I would like to know what is the fair amount as a function of distance. Um, so I'm gonna go back to this um, data I had from Manhattan which has 100 bins in trip distance. And once again, uh, if I look inside it, I know that I still have all the information on the fair amount or the, the hour of the day. So to get the minimum and maximum fares for all trips that, uh, that are inside our Manhattan area, we can do, uh, so this is my uh, data array here, you do dot bins, dot coordinates, and then the min and the max. And this will give you the, the min and the max of um, the fair amounts that you have for all the trips inside that bin. And the first thing you see is that the minimum is minus $242, which is a bit weird, and the maximum is $7,000, which seems a bit excessive. Um, so these values are maybe a bit strange, maybe indicative of bad data in the table. Um, so I'm gonna restrict the range from zero to $200. So you don't only have to uh, specify bins with a number of bins, just like in uh, NumPy, you can just directly specify the bin edges that you want. So I'm doing a, a lint space between zero and 200. And so because this had one dimension here, and now I'm making a new dimension, with 100 points, and now get something that's two-dimensional, and now you get something that looks like this. So I have the fair amount on the y-axis as a function of trip distance, and there's a few things we can say about the data. So first one is that you have this sort of diagonal line, which you kind of expect, like the further you're gonna go, the more you're gonna pay, um, makes sense. The other thing you see is, People mostly pay above the line, but not really below it, which, yeah. Apart from maybe here at the bottom, some people seem quite good at negotiating. And then the, the last one is uh, you have a, this sort of magical number of $52, which will take you anywhere from zero to 60 miles, which is kind of interesting. So is it bad data? Maybe there's a default value uh, that gets if it doesn't get overwritten, it's always $52. Um, I don't know. Well, actually, I think I do know because in the last few minutes that I have, um, I wanna talk about what, we have stuff that we build around Skip. So that was like mostly the core features of Skip. Um, but we think we've, uh, we've developed this thing, this library called Plop, which is what we, use for all the visualization we do in Skip. Um, the name sounds a little funny or something. Uh, first time I was working on the logo and my wife looked at it, she was like, you made something called Plop? Like, is that what they're paying you for? <laughs> but everybody sort of laughed, but everybody remembered the name, so we sort of stuck with it. It's supposed to stand for plotting plus plus, you know, but anyway. Um, so anyway, we've got a lot of tools, but I just want to show you quickly one of them, which I think is quite. So now I have, uh, I'm gonna go back to my original data and histogram it in three dimensions. So I have latitude, longitude, and the, the uh, fair amount. So I have a three dimensional cube. Um, and then I have this thing that we call the inspector plot, which, maybe I need to, maybe it's better like this. Um, 
so on the left is my, uh, the map, so it's latitude, longitude, so it's my, uh, two of my dimensions. And then on the right, what this is gonna be used for, I've got this little tool here and I can add these, these dots. And this is sort of probing the third dimension, so it's giving you the profile. Um, and you can, you, know, you can move these dots around and they will update. Um, so if I put one down here. And then, last thing I wanna do is go back to my airport and add another dot here. <coughs> and now all of a sudden you see that you've got this spike of $52. So I think what it is, is that it's all the airport shuttles that have got sort of a fixed fare, which is pretty sort of arranged and then they'll just take you anywhere. Um, yeah. Um, that was about it. Um, thank you for listening. There's a few links um, for, for you here. Go and check it out. I also would like to say that uh, we are hiring. We have a permanent position as a software engineer uh, developing so tools for science. Um, so if you're interested, uh, come and talk to me. Thank you very much. Like to take any questions? Yes. Uh, questions are welcome. You can stand by the yeah. I have a question about the units. How smart are they? Is there a, a predefined list of units you accept, and can they convert each other? Like, if you have grams, then you can say I want them in kilograms or tons or those kind of things. Yes. Um, so there's a long list of units. Um, it's uh, so because we so Skip is written. It has a C++ core. And then it has Python bindings on top. Um, and so the new list library is a runtime C++ library. And it has a very long list of lots of different units. And you can definitely do things like... Uh, just like you can convert from meters to kilometers with... Something like that will just tell you 200 centimeters. You can also convert to feet. Sorry? You can also convert to feet or miles or something um, like this. So not only SI, but can also Imperial. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I think it's because I had an interview. Hi. My name is uh, Mark. Thank you for a great and amazing uh, talk. My question is about the uh, plop, actually. Because yep. I can see you, you uh, love making things uh, interactive. You need to visualize big amounts of data. And in the X-ray system, there's always uh, the integration to hollow views and HV plot and so on. Have you considered building on that instead? Because they all have all the tools already for what you've been showing and so on. Uh, we have. Uh, we took a deep look at all of the, um, well, not all probably because there are a lot, but many different visualization packages. Um, I think the issue we had with hollow views is that your data needs to be either a pandas data frame or, or an X array data array. So we would probably have to convert to that. Let, uh, let's talk about it because what the system does is really they implement backends. So you could implement like a skip backend and then everything would just work. Mm. So yeah. Thank you. Sounds good. Hi, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I really liked the uh, feature where you could slice. Your, your data in units. Um, can you control the interpolation when you do that in Skip? So the way it works is that um, if you have, so it doesn't do any interpolation. That's something you could probably add on top. Okay. So it does uh, basically, uh, if, if you have the, a binage coordinate and you give it a value that's inside a given bin, then it will just return you that bin where that value you gave it is. If you don't have bin edges, so if your coordinates are actually marking exact points, then you have to have an exact match when you request uh, data with a unit. If not, it will tell you, I can't find anything. Yeah, I'll make a request on uh, GitHub. Um, okay. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, my question is maybe a philosophical one. Uh, what uh, what were the reasons why you uh, 
decided to create your own library and not to, for example, <laughs> extend the X-ray, mount the bind on that, and somehow do better combination out of these? So um, we looked at X-ray for a long time, and we got a lot of our inspiration from it. Um, before we started building it, and we have two reasons. Uh, the first one is that, uh, the first one is historical, is that to start with, we thought that Skip was going to need to interact with a lot of other C++ code at our facility. So we needed to have a C++ core, and then we sort of added Python bindings um, on top. This may not be so true anymore, but it was true when we started the project in 2019 or 2018. And then the second one is that we considered adding, contributing to X-Array, but we thought that if we wanted to add something as fundamental as either units or bin edges, it was gonna take a really long time to get it right and to get it adopted in X-Array, and we actually needed things to move quite fast. Uh, so those are the two reasons. Uh, we're not trying to replace X-Array, we just uh, yeah, needed something at our, uh, at our facility, um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Hi, uh, very nice talk and uh, awesome uh, results. Uh, I think that saving units is very important for sharing data also in the scientific community. Uh, so, but uh, first question is, uh, where did, do you store the units? Is it like the attribute or the column or is it like all the data structure in the file? It's in the C++ data structure, so inside okay. the variable. Um, so you sort of have, uh, I don't know if I can do this. I'm in full screen. Uh, we have sort of different uh, data structure. Uh, so you have the variable, which is sort of the okay. lowest level right. thing, and this is like in the C++, mm -hmm. and it's stored in there next to the the, the buffer, we have the dimensions, the units, and we can also store uh, variances like uncertainties alongside mm -hmm. the values as well. Oh, that's awesome. Um, uh, and the second question regarding the binning, uh, <coughs> can you use some custom grid instead of this regular uh, grids? Like so hexagonal, for example. Grid. It does not need to be uh, all of the same size, so uh -huh. your, your grids okay. can have different size, any size you want but they do have to be rectangular at the moment. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I guess questions are over. And thank you so much. It was such a delight to listen, such an interesting thank topic. You. And now we're in the lunch break. <laughs>